Thank you, Mateus. That was, that's amazing. I'm glad, uh, you know, when you typed in uh, most beautiful house uh, that I came up with that, I feel much safer now <laughs> as an architect. Uh, but no, fantastic. Very interesting uh, stuff. I think uh, we, we have some uh, questions coming in. Um, we have uh, from Laura, uh, much of the exploration at Aliers to be based on AI generative pattern language. Is it suggestive of structure, the last mid-century home, but is the AI also incorporating the physical aspects such as structural forces, acoustics, et cetera? Are these being blended together? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, so at the, at the moment, no, there is uh, like the physical aspects such as structural forces, acoustics and so on. Each one of those in itself would be an own approach to, uh, to an AI algorithm. So, I mean, the good thing about AI is that it can basically do two things really well prediction and uh, optimization. So, and if we talk, for example, about physical aspects such as structural engineering, structural forces, material properties, all of these can be encoded in a neural network and also be optimized. But we are doing this step by step now. We, 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 we are now at the point where we understand how we can visually work with um, neural networks so far. And now in the lab, uh, we, are, we are really trying to get into the point where we can also optimize for structural properties, material consumption, and so on. But very good question. Thank you very much. It, it's really fascinating. It seems like the more data you're collecting, the more you can integrate about information about that program. And then the, the algorithms can start to learn about yes. what that, that qualitative or, or informative data within like that's ingrained into that room. And it can start to predict a little bit more and more, but it requires a lot of data and adjacencies to, especially if you're talking about acoustics, you know, how it even positions the 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 program i mean the, 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 good, the good news is is that there is a ton of data out there it's just a question of how to collect it and how to make it work oh how do you see uh how do you see this in ai and uh, image generation helping in optimization when it comes to to architecture yeah, I'm, I'm a bit suspicious about it. I don't think that it helps a lot. Um, honestly, uh, what I've been I've been telling also my students and anyone else who wants to hear it or doesn't want to hear it, um, these diffusion models that we're seeing all over the place, as, as fantastic as they are and as fun as they are, uh, they're, in my opinion, a low-level AI application. Yeah. Uh, because yes, they have tons of data, and it's it, it, that's okay. Um, and I'm not gonna uh, throw shade on the guys who invented it because I think it was a huge achievement to do that. But for architecture, I think there's other areas that we need to be more aware of and interrogate better. Uh, so, uh, and, and the problem is that there is no, like at the moment at least, there are very small amount of of AI pipelines that are specifically designed for architecture. So we always have to remodel things that were for other uh, for our for other ideas. Yeah. Um, but as I mentioned before, I mean, I, I think that things like um, material optimization, yeah, in order to reduce the material consumption in construction, is certainly a great thing to do, and AI is fantastic for that. Um, or uh, another thing I've been working on is um, uh, recycling uh, using robots and in combination with AI. Because one of the things, I mean, in architecture, we produce so much trash. It's incredible. Yeah. But if we're actually able to have machines that are, that can sort through rubble from construction demolition and are able to divide the materials properly for reuse, that would be a game changer because we are not doing that now because it's so costly, that sort of uh, recycling of building material. Yeah. But if you do it properly, if you do it automated, we can also do it in the, in the West. It's only done now in, in, in certain countries where, where labor is maybe cheaper. It's a shame that we have to do that, by the way. I mean, that, that we have to basically throw away enormous amounts of material. The other problem is also that, as you might have heard, we're running out of good sand even to do concrete. So if we can find ways to, 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 to regain that, 
that would be that would be awesome. Um, and there's many other things like uh, optimization of construction site management. Yeah, that these are things that are not visual. That are that these are only things that can be optimized through uh, learning from enormous amounts of data. So anything that makes numbers can be used in AI. It's, by the way, even the pictures are numbers at the end of the day because what the AI reads is the RGB values of the image. So that's numbers. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty wild. When even when you're talking about how if you know technically it could sort trash, um, could we start to use AI to start to explore like room proximity and have it start to lay out floor plans for us? Yes. <laughs> I mean, we, we, I mean, we're already working on these sort of things. Like we have one of the largest data sets with annotated plans around at the moment at Taubman. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's going to be publicly available, by the way, but not yet. Yeah. Uh, because it's not completely finished yet. Uh, but the idea is, is once, if, again, for everything you need first a good data set before you can do anything. So if you want to do anything with plants, no matter if, if it's about proximity or acoustics or or temperature differences in rooms and so on, you need first the data and then you can work on it. And and we've been working now for over two years on this data set of plants, annotated plants, meaning that uh, in contrast to the things I showed today, where I was complaining that the, the machine does not understand what is a living room, what is a sleeping room and so on, with this new data set, it can, because it, it it's it's annotated, really describing what are, what are the different rooms. And once it has that concept, once it learns the concept, it can really generate plans that make sense, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Let's see. Yeah, and I, I love it that how you described earlier in your presentation. It's like it's really it's better to teach the machine than to tell to do something. And I, I think even when I was in college uh, learning computation, I was like, a, a computer's dumb. You know, you have to tell it to, to do something. But at this point, it's only as smart as the information that we're giving it. Yeah. Can I go to a question here? Because there, there was a quick question here. Why are we reluctant to say that AI thinks, but eager to say that it learns? That's a good question. Yeah. Because that's exactly what it is. AIs don't think. Yeah. Um, thinking is a process that we don't really understand entirely in neuroscience. And as long as we don't understand it in neuroscience, you cannot put it into mathematics. And as we cannot put it in mathematics, we cannot really put it into an algorithm. So we don't know how we think. Thus, we don't know how machines can think. But learning is something that we understand much better. Yeah. So anything that is done in AI space is for in, in not everything, but at least when it's about neural networks, it's based on what we know in terms of neuroscience about our own thinking processes. So we do understand, for example, how dreaming works, more or less. We understand how hallucination works, more or less. But once you have those concepts nailed down, you, you can actually put them into math. And once you have them as mathematics, you can implement them in an algorithm. Thus, we don't know how machines can think, but we know how they can learn. That's why I'm very hesitant to say that a machine thinks, but I have no problem to say that a machine can learn. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, So, and, and, and to piggyback off uh, what Tim mentioned, how far do we think we can go with this? What's What are the next steps that you see this going? I mentioned that already in the lecture before, before there's like several several ways to look at this. Um, it might be possible that simple architectural tasks, repetitive tasks, uh, can be automatized entirely through AI. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I, I think that the role of architecture or the role of the architect will change. Yeah. Um, but it always changes, right? I mean, it has been changing for the last 30, 40 years too with the introduction of computational design and so on. So there's, it's, it, you know, we, we, we're not drafting plans with ink anymore, right? So things change, that's normal. But there's always, I mean, the more I work with, with AI, the less I'm concerned, to be honest. Because I noticed that, um, that AI can be an expander of what I think and what I know and how I operate. Um, it can let me see things that I couldn't see before. Uh, 
So a latent walk is a good example for that. Uh, a latent walk basically interpolates between known data points. And what is in between there is normally not visible to us, but the machine makes it visible. It's like a microscope or a telescope sometimes. Yeah. It's also a machine that can be very powerful in, in interrogating human culture. And that might be one of the most interesting points about it, that it makes us understand what it means to be human. Yeah. So uh, also there are certain things in there that machines still cannot do. My wife thinks, Sandra Manninger, she thinks that it's going to be possible very soon. But for example, the weird ability that we have as artists, architects, designers, and so on, to see a chance in a mistake, right? It, it, something went wrong. You're like, wait a second, I can use that. That's interesting. If I turn it around like that, <laughs> it becomes the entrance of the building or whatever. You know what I mean? Like these sort of eureka moments that you have as a designer. Yeah. This is something that AI absolutely cannot do yet. Yeah. Uh, but it can create that eureka moment for you, meaning it, it, it throws a picture on you and you then are like, I can use that. That's interesting. So it's not the AI being creative here. It's actually your interpretation that is creative. Do you understand? So do not do not think that AI can replace you or that it can be creative or it can think. Like all those things, all those, this, yes, I know those things are floating around in media at the moment, this sort of fear mongering and so on. It's a tool. It's a very well, de it's a very well developed tool and it's a learning tool, but it's still a tool. Yeah. So grasp it, use it, I don't know where it's going to go. I have no answer to that. Yeah. But I can tell you, I can tell you one thing. If we as architects do not engage with it, yeah, someone else will do it for us. And then we have no say in that conversation anymore. So I would, I would really encourage you to, to embrace that and think about it. And as I mentioned in my lecture, I think it's the first really 21st century design method in architecture. I think it's a paradigmatic shift for sure. And I think we should engage with it because otherwise, you know, what I heard that recently was great. Uh, history waits for no one. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's even uh, we're, my firm, we're embracing it as a fantastic storyteller for as yep. a narrative to help enforce the de design and, and, and help support like, hey, look how the very early conceptual is like how we can do this or these concepts that we can start to explore and it's taking things to a whole nother level on design it, it is uh it's something that we're able to just text type something in and see it almost instantaneously and to develop yeah. it and suddenly you have a concept or an image that people can kind of get behind and build upon and we can start to develop and that's where we can put on the architecture hat and start to make architecture out of it so i, I feel like and, and hearing from you in your lecture it's like i feel like a new uh almost like a new position for architectures or in architects i feel much almost like yes and there's things that this is a fantastic tool but you know an architect really has to do this and this yes. can't be can't replace an architect but um Leland has a has a great uh, question. Uh, are are the AI algorithms limited by the two D nature of the input images that they are trained on? Can you expand on what you think two D training data can and can't do for architectural applications? Thank you, Leland. Uh, it's an, another great question. So, basically speaking, you can also work with three D data. Yeah. So with three D models, it's not limited to two D only. The, the only big big caveat with that is that once you move from 2D to 3D, the calculation power necessary to process the algorithm exponentially goes up. So um, uh, that's why you see so many 2D applications today in AI, not so many in 3D. We haven't found the optimization, how to optimize the algorithm to really manage that problem. Uh, but we have done experiments with 3D data to with 3D models, 3D model data sets too. So it works. Um, um, as I mentioned before, AI basically doesn't care whether it's 2D or 3D, right? It's only numbers for these systems. 
It's only data that they need to process somehow. So there is no limit to what you want to ask uh, or what you want to achieve with it. If you if you if you have historically two dimensional data from I don't know uh, the last five hundred years of toilets, then uh, you can you can feed it with it and and you try to optimize the size of a toilet. Yeah. So um, I mean that probably was not the best example to be honest, but you get the idea. Yeah, it's 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 really about like what do you feel? It's it's the usual computational problem: garbage in, garbage out. So if you don't have the right data, you're not going to get something good back. Yeah, and this is for me still the biggest problem we have in the architecture discipline is that we don't have good uh, data sets because we never cared about it. Yeah, now we're starting to care. Now we have to probably start to work on them. But either way, uh, there is no there is no restriction to what you want to achieve. If there is a specific question and you have the data for it, you can use a neural network or any other sort of AI system to to hopefully find a, an answer to your question. I mean, the, the other thing that it can do really well, I, I forgot one thing, is the aspects of, of I, I was talking a lot about optimization now. We were talking about optimization. By the way, the term optimization in architecture terms and in computer science is two different things, which is really funny, yeah? Because when we think about optimization, we have this, we, we put on our engineering head, right? And we're like, okay, we're gonna optimize this building now for, I don't know, structural performance or material consumption or, or circulation patterns, right? In, in, in computer science, in things like, uh, let's say a diffusion model like Midjourney, it is optimizing to perform the best possible solution for the prompt that you prompted it. It doesn't matter what the image is going to be at the end. So it's not optimizing for a good image, right? It's optimizing towards, you know, the the the, the, the natural language processing aspects in the algorithm allows to optimize. So it is it is really funny because I I, I always compare it to, I described it as the German engineering idea versus sort of like a, a sort of like a Disneyland optimization idea yeah it's a completely different different environment that's great <laughs> we we got a question from uh tim he says uh what do you think can be the intersection of ai and architecture and 3d construction printing yeah that's a really good one yeah you absolutely can do that i mean the, there's like several aspects that can be included when it comes to large-scale 3D printing. Um, on the one side, you, of course, there's the machine vision aspect, right? The things that are that are getting used to, uh, for example, right now for a car to recognize its environment. But if it's about 3D printing, you can, for example, train it to automatically understand where it should start, continue printing the whatever you're printing, right? So you don't have to uh, define the toolpath completely at the beginning. You might be able to just define, uh, yeah, here's the figure that you need to print, and it's going to figure out on its own what is the best ways to to really print that object, right? That's one. That certainly is a, is a possibility. The other one might be before you start even printing it. Uh, to have um, uh, a system that can optimize it uh, for material thickness and so on. And it would be so cool to have a nozzle that actually can can do variable thickness prints so that you can really print thicker where it's necessary for the material, uh, for, for the structural stability of the object, but you can print thinner where it's not necessary. And it can do that in combination with a neural network that understands structural integrity of an object. So there's a lot of possibilities there. Yeah, sure. It's amazing. And, and I love the, the idea of the, the possibility of being able to like 3D generate something from text. And so now you're taking it a step further where you could say, you know, text, you know, write something in the text and uh, and then have it right there ready as a 3D print. And that's it's really interesting. Um, and I, I have a quick question for you. Uh, you're one of the few practice practitioners who successfully constructed like architecture primarily based on AI design input. How do you overcome the challenges associated with proposing this type of work? Uh, well, we were lucky that at the moment when we got this commission, no one was discussing that. So it was it was it flew pretty much under the radar. Uh, now it probably might be a little bit more difficult. Um, 
I don't think there is a, I don't, I don't, this is like Pandora's box is open. I don't think we can stuff it back anymore. Yeah, it happened now. Um, I'm, I'm happy to propose. I mean, look, I invested now so much of my, so many years already in this sort of research. I'm surprised about the, the attention that it's getting, to be honest. Yeah. But um, I, I don't, I don't think we can evade this anymore. Yeah. It's going to become part of the architecture discipline. If you want it or not, I don't think we can forbid it anymore. It's there, right? The question now is how to how to use it. Like, what's the intelligent way of using this new technology? What's the responsible way to do it? What's the ethical way to do it? Yeah, many questions that we need to solve as a discipline right now. Yeah, really. Yeah, it, it, it it's fascinating on um, that that process that you did. Uh, for the for the schools of generating the, all those images and actually it, did you actually type in like the the program and uh, or was that something that you generate the forms and then you infill the program within the forms? Um, no, so the, the prompts contained the program. So if it in the program had like a, a about twenty five or thirty sorry thirty different build uh, elements and for each element we created an image however the interior that was not generated with the process the interior was really handmade yeah like traditional architects sitting down with a pen drawing over those results and saying we're gonna do this 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 so the, pro the, the process was not very ripe when we did that so i mean this was 2020 it's incredible how fast things developed i have to admit that three years and everything changed but um it was for us a very important learning process about understanding interior exterior how to deal with it making two different processes or just one for only for the exterior and then the rest by hand at the end we decided to do it by hand the interior yeah when you did the robotic gardens like what kind of images did you scrub uh was there a certain brand that you're a certain trend that you're you're going for or, or, or was it did you kind of like pick categorically like certain certain characteristics that you're looking for and just grab a large swaths of that or was it a, a really broad scrub of of different landscapes did you uh, have uh, so the satellite images um were specified on we used forests, desert, rock surface, uh, rock faces, mountains. So it's a, it's a, it was a huge set of. It has a lot of different landscapes in there. Yeah. And then when we created the style gun, uh, let and walk, it it gave us also like you can generate, for example, a hundred images, right? You can say, okay, here's the data set, generate a hundred images for me, and we generated about a hundred images. And then looked for the patterns that that we thought were interesting. By the way, again, uh, this this uh, aspect of human touch, right? That we I still had had to select and say like, yes, I like this one. I don't like this one. Yeah, this is a very human thing, and I think this gonna this is going to prevail also still with this new technology. And I remember Peter Eisenman once once said, which is is I think perfect for this too. If I don't like it, I change it. <laughs> yeah so and, and that shows like this this human power of i mean sensibility is also something really interesting like why do i decide for this image and not this image in in mid journey yeah right so there's still this moment and uh, can i ask you you use mid journey right yeah yeah okay you get these four variations right how long does it take you to to, to select the one you like Oh, it takes, a, it takes, I mean, once I find that one, I like it, but it takes a lot of iterations to, to start to get to one that I, I like. Yeah, yeah, but the moment you see the one that you like, like how long does it take it for you to say, yeah, that one? Oh, pretty quick. It's, a, it's quick. Yes, I thought so, because it's the same for everybody. Everybody, I've asked a lot of people, like how much does it take you when you get the four images and say, like, yes, that one. Yeah. And that's human sensibility. That is something that is... We don't know, and another one of the things we don't understand exactly how it works, but that intuition to be able to be able to like pick the right image right away, yeah, is nothing that a machine can do yet. Yet, 
Yeah. But all, all those things are for me super exciting, like these ideas of, uh, you know, uh, sensibility, aesthetics, and so on. Like, I'm, 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 I have like a new paper in my head that I need to get out. Yeah, about that. But um, I, I'll tell you when I have it. I don't know. I cannot, I cannot explain it totally right now. Well, it's interesting. I, and, and as we use all these new data, and and um, and Alex has a, a great point of uh, with. You know, with this new data set, what novel spaces do you think the AI model will predict? Rethinking our, our trusted spaces, an example like a house or living room, a bedroom. Uh, are there any targeted areas or uses or building types that it starts to rethink? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think it depends on how you're using it, uh, which which with which kind of um, model. So, for example, uh, our our data set consists of apartments that exist, right? That are out there, that are documented on plans and so on, right? In general, AI always works with existing historical data, which, by the way, also leads to the assumption that AI can never create anything new. By the way, yeah. Um, but at the same time, I can tell you that depending on how clever you are with the algorithm, it, it could up it could come up with something that is so different that you might might think that is new, but it might just have been something we have not seen before but existed already. It becomes a bit philosophical here, sorry. But uh um I I personally think that yes, it can come up with things that are unexpected and different and new to us, yeah? And that is a huge chance to change architecture for the better. It, it makes me think of the example you gave about the, the robots, robot robotic arms in the car factory. You know, it seems like program, especially a living room and stuff, that function really relies on, the, on people, on us. And it's mm -hmm. relying on historic data. When so, when there's something that's new, that's like maybe something completely innovative that uh, socially we're using the living room differently. Do you think that AI needs to catch up with that, or do you think that AI is able to somewhat start to predict those trends of human behavior? I think it can predict those. Yeah, as I mentioned before, AI is really good in prediction, and there is something called energy-based models that um, is particularly well suited for what you described right now. I mean, we've been, we've been trying to, we've been looking into that in the lab. Uh, I haven't wrapped my head entirely around it, how this works. I, I have to say also, I'm not the computer science expert in our group. I'm an architect, but um, I try to understand the algorithm as far as I can in order to be able to understand of how I can use it in, a, in an interesting role within the research. But, this being said, provided you have the correct data and provided you have a good, for example, energy-based model, you totally can predict that. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. What um what led you to write neural your your book, Neural Architecture Design and Artificial Intelligence? Um I didn't mention that at the beginning, but I have a long uh on-off relationship with AI. Let me put it that way. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I we start. And my wife actually is the one who actually came up with that first because she she knew people from the uh, um, AI laboratories in Vienna, in Austria, where we come from, and we met with these people. And I'm talking like late '90s. Yeah. And we met with them, and we were speculating about how we could use it in architecture. And there was the, the tools were not there, the technology was not there, the algorithms were were not yet really done and and through the years we, we occasionally touched on it and like for example we gave the first machine learning workshop at the angevante in vienna in 2006 so there's this history for it but it, it developed a lot in the last five six years right when we noticed that ah okay the algorithms are there the math has become better the machines are powerful enough so that we can really do something with it and I started writing papers, a lot, a lot, a lot of them. Yeah, and at some point I thought, okay, I have enough material actually to make a, a book out of it. So that's actually how. And then papers in a book is is two different stories, right? So it took then about a year to make the book. Yeah, maybe even longer. 
and then uh, another another year for, to publish it. Yeah. So and in these two years, already so much happened that you can I can tell you my next book is gonna come out soon. <laughs> it's so much happening. Yeah. The content. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a, uh, another question. Um, and, and for um, that they're interested in uh, research and work on AI and architecture. So they were wondering how can they start. In, uh, in the research and work of AI in the architecture field? Uh, come and study with me. <laughs> and that would be the easiest answer. I mean, uh, I would say that, um, first of all, I mean, there's like, so I don't think that there is um, a really good answer for that because the field is so new. Yeah, that there's, first of all, there's not that many offerings yet. I'm sure this is going to change very quickly. I know that a lot of architecture schools are starting to to teach similar things than what we started to do in, in Michigan about three, four years ago. Uh, so there's demand for it. And the question already shows that there is demand for it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think there might be also... Uh, Okay, here's what I'm going to say. The first thing you need to do is start learning Python. Yeah, because Python is the base for everything that gets done in computer science for uh, AI. It's sort of like the common language for programming in there. Once you have a basic understanding of how Python works, and there is really free courses online to do like the basic, to basically learn uh, Python. Once you have that, you can go into GitHub and search for things that you're interested in terms of uh, applying that to architecture. Let's say 22D style transferring, for example. It's it's, it's there, right? Um, or optimization patterns for plans. I think there's like a ton of already AI, uh, AI and architecture related uh, GitHub repositories out there, yeah, including ours, the Neural Zoo. Um, and then... Um, the next thing you do is basically get an account on Google Colab and start working. It's fascinating. It's like it seems, as you mentioned, like Python. It seems to be even with with Grasshopper and Dynamo and uh, all the computational tools, and with even with this new technology, Python is the base of everything. It seems like absolutely. You're not going to regret learning Python because it's applied in so many areas now that it's it's really it's really worth doing it uh, we, we have a question uh from rex <laughs> you said how soon uh before ai is a real-time plan checker for conflicts and code compliance <laughs> yeah I, I i think i mentioned it in another lecture maybe uh but um yeah give me half a million dollars and you can have it in half a year <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but no, like seriously speaking, I'm sure that somebody's working on it. Yeah. Because it's such an, a logical way to you. It's so, it's so obvious to use it that way. Yeah. I would be surprised if no one's working on that. So I'm sure this is going to take, it's going to go faster than you think. Yeah. It's probably going to be implemented in, in, in cut software very quickly as an, as a plugin. Yeah. It, it, it seems the the codes it's so formulaic it, it is like yeah it's just setting up the framework it feels like yeah it's really obvious that i mean somebody's working on it for sure <laughs> um we have a, a a question from kathy uh what is it about ai with respect to application to music and to the written word that is seemingly so different from the application of AI in architecture being so successfully productive, predictive. Uh, That's a tricky one, Kathy. That's a <laughs> yeah, I was trying to figure out. I think, I mean, I think it all goes back again to the training data. Yeah, uh, you can do this with music because music is a very specific system that can be organized on a pattern very quickly and you can get out something that sounds fairly good, right? Uh, same with the written word. I mean, this is a very specific frame of things you can do with words and you have 
enormous amounts of training data, right? I mean, I remember before ChatGPT came out, there was another, I actually trained a neural network on Ernest Hemingway, where it was where I was able to to, rec- to to write an essay a la Hemingway. And it absolutely can, but I can also tell you the difference. It sounds like Hemingway, but there is no original thought in there. That's the problem, right? And also, when you, when you talk about music and literature, all of those have the same problem. They sound kind of interesting and fun and different, but there is no, 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 nothing new in there. Yeah. And with architecture, the problem actually amplifies because our discipline is so, I mean, I don't want to say architecture is so complex, but I, I want to say that there's a, a lot of different areas involved in, in, in making a successful architectural project, right? It's not just the, the sketch of a plan or the sketch of a section. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to repeat now what are all the things that are involved in successfully creating a project, but I think that it, there's more complexities involved. And the more complexities you have, the more calculation power you need. That's just the way it is. Um, I'm just rambling here. I don't, I'm not yeah. entirely sure how to answer this question. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting one because also, you you know, it's a very, um, um, with language, it's a syntax. And even with music, it, there's a certain note, tone, or to, um, certain certain um what do i want to say uh it's or certain sounds that sound pleasing and i think we can you know script that and uh and have that almost like as a database i think and um it's very interesting <laughs> um and i just want to take a, qu- a quick side note on uh, mateus what what is computational design to you uh what it, it, we're at um such an important part in society on how computational is is evolving and i would love to just hear your opinion on what you think computational design is that is a good question um i think computational design is an area of design that utilizes advanced computational tools I mean, like software, uh, computers, digital fabrication. I think all of that is part of this sort of ecology. Yeah, Probably even AI is part of, of course, that computational design universe, if you take it as a design tool. Uh, it's a tool that allows to, ex- to, to enhance and expand the ability of a designer uh, to observe the world through a different lens, uh, to... Um, to uh, increase the ability of the architect to um, um, push his design abilities further, right? So uh, I don't see, I mean, I, I, I have to admit that I'm not one of the designers who sees computational design only as a tool of optimization and simplification or streamlining of design uh, questions. For me, computational design itself poses uh, existential design questions to me. Yeah, uh, meaning that I continuously have to interrogate myself between uh, my being as a human and my being as somebody who communicates with something that is non-human. So that's why I like, for example, to talk about post-human design. Yeah, when I talk about post-human design, I don't mean design after humans. Humans are still there. It just means it's it's a design where the human is not necessarily on the top of a pyramid of design and controls everything top down, but rather is sharing a field of design with other players. And they can be computational, they, they can be non-human, they can be mechanical, they can be uh, animals. Yeah. So this, this sort of sharing a platform of design that allows this sort of communication between those. And the funny thing is that computational design is sort of like the, the bonding agent between all these post-human figures, yeah? Because it translates between them. Data is, some, data is something, when I talk, when I say, for example, that animals or nature is part of that design ecology for me, I'm not on the top, but on, on a plane, yeah? The machine allows me to communicate with them through data, yeah? And I see design as something that that actually takes all those things in 
and is able to combine them into something that becomes habitable by humans or, or, or non-humans. Yeah? But it creates somehow an impact on the environment. What what led you to that moment that you were that you drove that passion for design technology? Was there a moment, or was it something that kind of like you you kind of realized that took a a, a few years or took some time? It was pretty early on in my career as a student already. Um, I, I, I I'm so old that I'm one of those first generations who used computers at all in studio, right? Can can you imagine that? So it happened by, almost by coincidence because I, I, I started studying at the Angewandte and in the second year, they wanted to start this experiment about using computers in studio. And for that experiment, they selected, I think, six or seven students uh, to do that experiment. And I was one of them. But I don't know why, but this is like you, you. Yeah. Okay, okay, fine, fine. And I got a I got a course in Unix, um, and uh, I learned to program a little bit, and and then we started to use a three D modeling software. And the moment I started to understand how my emotions with the mouse and the keyboard start to form the thing on the screen, I was, I was sort. It was like wow, it's yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. It, it is. Um, it, it's such a. I don't. I feel like that now is such an exciting time for design technology. And I, where where time where some people are a little hesitant. I was like, oh, geez, it's taking over everything. I think this is. It seems like this is such a great opportunity, and so many things are evolving so fast. It's such a great time to be part of this. And and. Uh, and, and understand everything that's happening and new potential and new designs that's evolving from this. Is a, it's Absolutely. Great. I agree. Yeah. Um, Super exciting. We have a, a, another question. What, what do you think about the potential bias embedded in the results generated by these algorithms? Because of the data which fed into the algorithms could be biased and what could the solution be to mitigate it? That's also a really good question. Uh, I just had, uh, exactly a week ago, I had a colloquium at Taupin College called Data Justice, AI and Design, yeah, which exactly discussed that problem. Uh, because it is absolutely clear that the, the vast majority of data sets used today for whatever are heavily biased towards Western culture. And of course, meaning Western architecture and so on, right? <laughs> Um, and it's it's uh, you can do like a very simple experiment, for example, in Midjourney to see that. And this is an experiment that was actually proposed by Ngozi Inri, who is one of the developers of Disco Diffusion. She said, if you type in a random number and letter combination in Midjourney, and say you know and and go return, it's still going to generate images. Yeah, but because you don't have any, uh, because you, you don't give the algorithm any sort of guidance of what to generate, it will start to um, to draw from the largest parts of the data set to create an image. And what do you get in return? Four images of white girls. Wow. Yeah, so... Um, so it seems obvious that it, the, the, the data set is heavily biased towards white, West, and girls, women. Yeah. Uh, that tells you already a lot. Yeah. Um, the, the, I mean, it's, it's a really difficult problem because uh, how do you avoid? You can probably not avoid bias completely, by the way. Yeah. Um, but uh, at least it should be able to create a more fair approach to what is represented in those data sets. But here's already the problem. You can only represent in these data sets cultures that are image-based or that have a huge image culture, right? That's why there is so much Western content in there. Yeah, That's why there is almost no content from cultures that are not so image-driven, right? You can say Islamic culture, for example doesn't have, you know, just by religion, they don't have a lot of representation of humans. Yeah. Um, and then you also have to be able to afford 
to be representative imagery, right? I mean, so this is this is a deep problem, and this is actually nothing that I can respond to in a short response here. This is something that really is 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 a huge problem. And the only way we can work on that is to be aware that it exists and then try to mitigate it by, uh, for example, introducing other cultures into the data set. I think that's what they're doing. They're try I mean, it's not that the companies are not trying. They're trying, believe me. But um, it will take time. The damage is done. And repairing the damage is going to take a while. Yeah. So, yeah, the ex we've had a, a similar experience with, uh, with us when someone typed in a, a nurse on the bedside and it came up with a, a woman nurse. And it was like, well, not all nurses are, are women. And uh, yes. yeah, it's those statistical biases that, um, but I'm glad they're addressing it. It's, a, it's a, something that I never thought of until it was brought up. I was like, that's, it, it is, it is yeah. fascinating. But I can tell you, for example, that, that in the lab, we're actively working on that. So for example, the, the, the plan data set, that, the apartment data set that we have, yeah, that was labeled by people worldwide because we wanted to avoid to have only, I don't know, top and college students labeling those. They're labeled by people from everywhere. And also the plans are from everywhere. So we didn't we didn't focus on only European or American plans. We really wanted to have plans from China, from Africa, from India, from Latin America, and so on. And I think I mean I hope I think we achieved it. Yeah, but that brings me to an important point because architecture is so late in the game of creating data sets for their purposes. We still can we still can uh, do data sets that are fairly fair. Yeah, because we don't have the problem that, like computer science, they started doing data sets 50, 60 years ago, more, uh, almost 80 years ago. Yeah. And they have inherited that problem over and over through the time. We don't have that problem because we don't have that inheritance. So we can basically, from scratch, start doing our data sets for architecture and make sure that they're not completely biased, at least. When, when you're gathering all that data and years of data, um, and you start, you have to categorize that data. Is there an issue with category, categorizing some of that, like where you miscategorize things or it, it, where, it, like if you talk about a Gothic architecture, but it's really in between the, the Gothic and Renaissance time, like how do you category, categorize yeah. that? So categorization in itself, similar to labeling, has some has some problems to it. So first of all, uh, I would like to point out uh, uh, Kathy Crawford's Atlas of AI. I think there's a whole chapter on categorization in there where she describes basically how categorization is, <laughs> is also a form of a political act and similar to labeling. When you label an image, it's also at the end of the day a form of a political act. Yeah, because you are defining through the labeling or through the categorization how this image will be perceived within the data set. Now, uh, for your, your architectural question, um, yeah, I mean, when you say like between Gothic and Renaissance, um, that, that there might be something in between and so on. Honestly, I'm not an art historian to do this sort of uh, categorizations, um, but uh uh, you can create actually data sets with, with a lot of categorizations. Like I take again the, the plain, the plan data set that we have. The plan data set that we have have over 80 categories. Yeah. Uh, in, in exactly to address what you're saying, like nuances of differentiation in apartments, right? Did you know that Finnish apartments sometimes have saunas next to their bathroom? I didn't know that. It was new to me. But we but we had to do like a category. And you see also cultural differences, which are really funny. Like, for example, uh, we had one a woman uh, labeling uh, plants for us. And she uh, is Brazilian. She was in Rio de Janeiro. And she sent us this question saying, like, I'm, I'm labeling this apartment. And there's something next to the bathroom. And I have no idea what that could be. I have no idea. And we looked at it, and it was exactly that. She got actually an apartment from Finland with a, with a sauna, but because that doesn't exist in Brazil, who would, who in his right mind would do a sauna in Brazil? Um, 
she didn't know what it is, right? So you, if you see again cultural differences and nuances. By the way, it was our mistake because I actually wanted her to label a plan from uh, from Brazil, which wouldn't make more sense, right? But somehow things got mixed up, I guess. But so much for categorization. Uh, I think you can categorize with with a lot of nuance. Yeah, it's totally possible. Do you see uh, with all this data? Do you see there if there's an advantage between small architecture firms and and large architecture firms? Is there a disadvantage of having um, uh, having so much access to data? Ah man, uh, the access to data is 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 a critical thing. I mean, first of all, if you learn a little bit, you can create your own data sets as a small company. Yeah. Um, with not a lot of financial investment because scraping images from the internet, I don't know how long it's going to be allowed to do that, by the way, but scraping images from the internet is actually quite a simple Python code that you can use to do that. Yeah. I've used it a lot. Yeah. Uh, there's, of course, still questions about the ethics of scraping and so on. It's another problem. But the the other one being i agree with you actually that if you're a larger company you might have a little bit of an advantage because if you want to be fast and you want to have a lot of data annotated quickly yeah that's going to cost yeah i mean that's why they, creating data sets is actually expensive yeah but what i see happening what could be absolutely a model is that smaller companies might be uh, commissioned to contribute to data sets and getting paid for it. Yeah, because you still need expertise to, like for example, I, I, I'm, I'm, you saw the Gothic, uh, Gothic architecture um, uh, let's walk in my lecture. So for that, we had to create a data set of Gothic architecture. So I scraped the internet, yeah, uh, and looked for images for the data set. And the first time I tried it, I made a little mistake. I scraped goths. <laughs> okay, so you can imagine how my data set turned out, right? Yeah. Yeah. But you still need a human to see that mistake, first of all, right? And then I, 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 I scraped for gothic, yeah? Mm -hmm. And it was still like, I mean, like 80% of the data set was useless, yeah? Mm -hmm. And then a scrape for Gothic architecture became better. And, and then you have to think about it, like how can I apply? And then you start to, like, to, to look for, for very specific terms that have to do with Gothic architecture, like Rayonant uh, or uh, Rip Vault and things like that. But to do a good data set, you need this here first. Yeah, you have to know what you're looking for. And secondly, you still need a human to go through the data set and throw out the things that are completely useless. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying the model of having an architect contributing to a larger data set and getting paid for it as a job is definitely something that I can see happening. It, it is very fascinating how that, yeah, it, 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 and under, gathering that data um, takes time, takes time to do. And, and, and even with uh, using that Python script to, to scrape the internet or even using the information from our BIM models or something that's incorporating that, that takes takes time to do. Yep. Um, a, a, Andrew had an interesting point of, uh, of, uh, um, of this, of, with, of what do you see of being lost from the lexicon of human architectural design processes in a post AI world? It seems a sea changes in tool advancement are reciprocated by the extinction of some of the other definitive qualities that date the work. Hmm. I.e. the character of hand drawn with pens versus the same as a hand using a mouse. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, in, in, a, in another lecture, I mentioned that I can totally see that because of the impact of computational tools and more specifically the impact of AI to architecture, it's very likely that there will be a re-emergence of the value of the handmade. Yeah, meaning that I can totally see that uh, some wealthy people 
would like to commission an architect who exclusively works with paper, pen, cardboard, and ink. Yeah, because it gives the work he does another value than being generated by a computer. So it becomes a, lux a luxury item that you, you're you sitting with your five collaborators in an office with no internet. Yeah. <laughs> And you're like you know, and you have two two people, you know, crafting models, really beautiful, beautiful models, handmade in cardboard or whatever, or balsa wood. Yeah. Yeah, right. right. I, I don't know. What I'm what I'm trying to say is is that I think things are gonna change because of the impact of that tool. But not not only for the the negative, but also for the positive, specifically to Andrew's question, like about how the, the sort of lexicon of architectural creativity, which has evolved over hundreds of years, uh, continues to, to 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 continues to impact. Yeah, the sad part about it is that it becomes a luxury item. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. It makes sense. When when we gather all that. Um all this data to create these new these processes who who owns the data at the end of the day huh. that's a great question this is the, the big discussion at the moment yeah because if you if i'm not even talking about architecture but if you, i hope you are aware that every time you download a, a nice funny filter on instagram or you or you uh, for your face for example yeah that 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 data is getting used to train neural networks for better facial recognition, for example, or that when you sign up for Facebook and Instagram, you basically give away all your images, your 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 location data, all the context that you have in your phone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so Meta has that data, yeah, and how they use that is very untransparent. Yeah, we, we don't know exactly what to do with it. They certainly use it for targeting commercials to you. Yeah. But who knows what else is getting used for? So if you used if you ever used one of those fun filters, you rest assured your face is in a facial recognition data set. Yeah. Uh, but the question is who owns it, right? Because the, the funny thing is that it seems, from what I understand, it's still that you own it, but they have all the rights to use it. So, yeah, um, uh, it's it's a good question. I, I I think this whole thing is extremely unfair. Yeah, because the value of the data that you're giving away on a daily basis surpasses by far the development cost for a funny little app. Yeah. So um, I've been speculating that wouldn't it be more fair if every single time that you're posting something that you're sharing something that is going to get used for data collection either way, that you get like a micro cent, like a little bit. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, people could make a living out of it probably. Yeah. So um, the, the question of who owns the data is very important because whoever owns the data has the power. It's, it, it seems like every time there's a free app, the app isn't the product, you're the product. You know, you're getting, they, that's why they did it. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Well, Mateus, this has been a fantastic discussion. Um, this is really fascinating. And, you know, I, I can't thank you enough for joining and uh, having this lecture with us. Um, I know you've really sparked my imagination and I, I we'd love to just continue this conversation, but I know we're, we're getting pretty close, but I just want to say thank you very much for uh, for uh, joining us and uh, and presenting everything, it's it's been fantastic. It was a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, and, and, and <laughs> thank you everyone for also joining. That we have a uh, a lot of really exciting uh, events happening uh, this year for Codesis. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, and yeah, if if we want to continue this chat, you know, join our our Discord. Um, we'll be posting this up on on YouTube. Um, so again, thank you all for joining. Um, again, Mateus, I want to say thank you again. This is, this has been fantastic.